do you have normal PI interval? So we're looking at beginning of the P to the end of the R. And what this represents is a v node function. Remember the a v node should hold the signal for a tenth of a second. So you definitely need the PR interval to be at least a tenth of a second. So one of the problems can be too short. Another problem can be too long. Too short is simple and it's very similar to what we just did. Since too short would be there's no delay. There's no tenth of a second in there. What that would mean is that little AV node is right there and it wants to send the signal through, but the signal did not go through the AV node. The AV node needs to pause for a tenth of a second. If you don't have that tenth of a second, you did not go through the AV node. So that would be too short. Problem with too long. Again, we're talking about tissue that's in the middle of the heart, and so it might not, it might be the first place to not get enough blood flow. So I'm saying, what if there's not enough blood flow in there? Really, three things can happen, and they're called blocks, they're called heart blocks. You can have first degree block. First degree block is there's a delay. It's too much time between the P and the Q. That's called a first degree block. Problem with that, this is going to probably lead to a second degree and a third degree. Second degree block. P wave, but it wasn't followed by QRS. So in that case, the P, the atria contracted, but the AV node couldn't send it through to the ventricle, so there was no ventricular signal. So that's a P wave not followed by QRS. So you missed a beat. Third degree block is hard to draw. I'm trying to draw is the P wave and the QRS are completely asynchronous. So first degree block, there's a delay. Secondary block, sometimes you miss a beat. Um, missed ventricular beat. Third degree block, Atria and ventricles are unsynchronized. <coughs> the ventricle has its own pacemaker if it's not receiving a signal from the atria. So in the case of third degree block, nothing is getting through here. So the atria are contracting. The ventricles are not receiving a signal, so they pick up their own pacemaker and they start contracting on their own. The difficulty with that is the atria usually contracts at 70 beats per minute. Ventricular contraction, ventricular pacemakers are much slower. So the atria may be contracting 70 beats per minute, but the ventricle is only contracting 40 beats per minute. So the atria is contracting completely unsynchronized from the ventricle, which on an EKG would mean the P wave and the QRS are completely unmatched. 
So for you, what we want to look at is the duration of your PR interval. Essentially what we need to do is we need to convert the time between the beginning of the P and the end of the R into time. We need to convert the trace into time. And the way you do that again is the small blocks are 0.04 seconds. Since we want our interval to be between 0.12 and 0.20 seconds, we need it to be between 3 and 5 small squares. So I'm going to look at the P and the R, and I count four small blocks, which is great. It's right in that three to five range, so it's not too long. It's not too short. So on the lab sheet, you will count the number of small blocks between the beginning of the P and the end of the R, multiplied by 0.04, Tell me what your PR interval is. Again, if it's one block, then it's 0 0.4 seconds. 0 0.04 seconds. Two blocks. 0 0.08, 0 0.12, 0 0.16, 0 0.20. If it's 0 0.24, it's six blocks. And that's getting a little too long. Our next one is QRS complex. We're looking at the shape of it, the duration of it. To be honest, the only one I think we can do with our EKG, EKG machines is the first one, what's your QRS duration. I really wouldn't trust the pathological QRS, or is the QRS very large? You can't really determine the size of the QRS and use that as a diagnostic, because it depends on so many other things, like are you hydrated? Do you have a lot of subcutaneous fat? So males versus females would be different. It's hard to measure this, the amount of voltage because so many other things go into that. But we're going to do what is your QRS duration. This is the last easy one, and then the last two ones are tough ones. So if you need to take a nap before we get to the hard one, take a nap now. Okay. So it's do you have. Normal QRS. I guess I could say QRS complex. What we're looking at here is technically when voltage comes down the septum, it has two different what are called bundle branches. And then the voltage heads up the ventricular walls. If I can kind of just dot in an EKG, what we're looking at is as this voltage goes down the heart, this is what takes us up on our EKG. This voltage up the ventricular walls is what brings us back down. So we're looking at depolarization of the ventricles. Where things can go wrong are odd shapes. Or too large. Odd shapes are going to be problems with these bundle branches. Again, the main current comes down in two bundle branches. The inside of the heart might be the last to get blood, and so there can be a problem there. If you have lack of blood flow to the inside of the heart, then that voltage cannot go through there. It has to go around. And so, the path will still be found, but you have to go around. The way I think about it is, is there are no nerves in your heart, but there are some cells that are better at conducting electricity, and these bundle branches are really good at conducting electricity. 
But if they don't have enough blood flow, so they're not working, the voltage will still make its way, but it will go around. The metaphor for me is if a highway is blocked, you'll still be able to get where you need to go, but it's going to take longer because you? you're going to have to go around, you're going to have to take streets that are not accustomed to that much speed. So here, the voltage will still go around, but it won't be able to go as fast because it doesn't have that highway. What that means now for the EKG is this is going to be stretched out. So your QRS is going to get wider because you can't shoot right down those bundle branches. You have to go around. You can have a situation where just one of the bundle branches is blocked. That means one side of the EKG is going to be fast. So you go up really fast because you're catching this voltage. But going around the other way will take longer. So you see that kind of shape. Again, if you don't trust my drawings and you want to look at the real ones, then download the electronic copy of this lab. And it will click you over to ECG Library and you can see actual ECG, which is pretty cool. If you have extra muscle, so if you have extra muscle, maybe both sides have too much muscle. You have lots and lots of voltage. Lots and lots of voltage. Then you might expect your ECG to have really tall QRSs. Again, this is not really very diagnostic because it could be just that you were really well hydrated that day, so the electrical voltage from the heart made it out to the leads really, really easily. So what you're going to do is look at your QRS duration. And again, you're going to look at the number of small squares from the beginning of the Q to the end of the S, and you're hoping that it's less than 0.12 seconds. Since each small block is 0.04 seconds, what you really mean is you would like to have less than three small squares between the beginning of the Q and the end of your S. So here is the beginning of our Q, there's our S, I count two small blocks, she has a normal cure restoration, it's not too long. So this is kind of what I was trying to draw, you have that normal kind of depolarization and then you have this extended QRS, you see them both at the same time. The next one we're going to do is QT interval, and to be honest, the next two are the ones that I think, well I think there's three that are fair game on the practical because I think they are important, and again I'm just trying to encourage you to not necessarily learn ECG, but at least be able to put together the puzzles so that you can have the confidence that you can figure out anything, I suppose. But I would like you to have QRS axis down, that's fair game on the practical, normal QT interval, and then ST save. Those are the three that I think are really pretty important. So we're asking here is, do you have a normal QT interval? What we're looking at is the QT. In a normal what the QT is really telling us it's showing us cardiac muscle action potentials. So here we have depolarization. The T wave is repolarization. 
So we see depolarization and repolarization. So this would be depol right here and right here. This would be repol, the T wave, and right here. So the QT is telling us how long cardiac muscle is staying depolarized. The reason you care about that is if I go back and put a heart in here, and I say this is the normal conduction typo, what I'd like to do is focus on if there's two cells right here next to each other. And I want to draw two cells, drawn them rectangular. These cardiac muscles are kind of branched and rectangular. We talked about this before. We said we did it with how AR cells stimulate cardiac muscle. So don't draw this, because I'm going to erase it. We talked about how this AR cell stimulates this cardiac muscle. Is calcium and sodium leak? from this cell over to this cell to stimulate one cell to the next, the next, the next. And we mentioned that every cell then stimulates in a row like that. It's still true out here, way away from the, the AR cell, it's still true way out here. That what happens when this cell is going through its action potential is sodium and calcium are coming into this cell. They're going to leak over through the intercalated disc to stimulate the next cell. So now this cell reaches minus 55, goes through its action potential. Sodium and calcium leak into this cell, leak over to the next cell, this cell gets to its minus 55 and kicks off another action potential. So we go action potential the whole way along. Now you might ask, how come sodium and calcium that's coming into this cell doesn't leak back through the intercalated disc and stimulate this cell. So if sodium and calcium can leak this way and this cell can stimulate this one, how come the sodium and the calcium can't go backwards and activate this cell? And half of that is true. The sodium and calcium that's leaking into this cell is going over to this cell. It's also backing back up into this cell. The thing is, is this cell is in refraction. It's in its refractory period. So you might have remembered this term. Just I'll draw it here just to remind you really quick. It's in neuronal action potentials, they look kind of like this. And there was a time right here where that neuron is in refraction, it's in its refractory period, and it can't be activated again. And the reason is, is because all the ion channels that cause this are basically inactive. They're in their own little timeouts. The same thing happens in cardiac muscle. This guy goes through his action potential. All those ion channels enter a refractory period. And then they can't be stimulated again, even though sodium and calcium can come back in this direction. What, were to, what would happen if you have a long QT? A long QT means you have a long QT. Now if you look at our action potentials, It's really, really extended. What that means for two cells next to each other, say this guy is normal, and he has his refractory period. The guy next to him stays active so long that its neighboring cell comes out of refraction. Now you can backwards activate. So if this guy is, has a really, really long action potential, way out here, if there's still sodium and calcium coming in, now it can back up. This guy's out of refraction. So all of a sudden now we're activating in this direction. That's a bad thing because if this was a heart, now all of a sudden this guy just became a pacemaker. And there's all kinds of cells all over that can suddenly start activating their neighbors. And this is called ectopic pacemakers. These are called ectopic pacemakers. So
So rather than having this nice conduction system that pushes blood in one direction and pushes it out of the heart, the muscle is contracting kind of non-uniformly. It's fibrillating. And so you're not able to push blood out of the heart. So this would be ventricular fibrillation. So the reason you care about long QT is because now you can start having cells activating their neighboring cells and creating ectopic pacemaker. And that's where we went yesterday with Michael Jackson and we went with other potassium imbalances. We said hyperkalemia can lead to long QT, can lead to cardiac arrest. Now you might ask, and this is just a preview of where we're going, how do you get this long extended QT? And the way you get there is in a normal cell, I'll do a normal cell. Potassium is on the inside, and some potassium is on the outside. And this repolarization phase requires potassium leaves the cell. All of a sudden you have hyperkalemia, which means more potassium. When it comes time to repolarize, potassium doesn't want to leave. It says there's already potassium out there. I don't have a diffusion gradient to leave. So it takes longer to leave. So that's what can extend the QT's hyperkalemia. The tricky thing about the calculation is the QT will shorten and lengthen slightly with heart rate. And so you need to judge the QT interval based on the overall heart rate, which means the RR. So our calculation is down here. We've got to take our QT in seconds, which means that we've got to multiply small blocks by 0 0.04, and divide that by the RR duration, which means we've got to take the small blocks between an R and R. We have to take the square root of it, and then divide it by that number that we got for QT. So the equation for QT interval is QT divided by the square root of RR. So the QT is Q to the end of T. And that looks like about eight blocks. So we're going to take eight small times 0 0.04, and that's going to give us 0 0.32 seconds. RR is the duration between an R and an R. And that looks like, I'm going to go with 16, 17. It's probably 18. 16. 16 small and 0.04. But we're also going to have to take the square root of that. 0 0.04 times 16 is 0 0.64. But we're going to have to take the square root of that, which is 0 0.8. So now we have 0 0.32 divided by 0 0.8. And our answer is 0 0.4 seconds. Is 0 0.4. Okay, so let's go through it again. First thing you're going to do is get your QT. So the beginning of the Q to the end of the T, count the small blocks, and multiply by 0 0.04. 4 times 8 is 32, so my answer is 0 0.32 seconds. That's your QT. You're going to need to divide that by the square root of RR. So you find your R by going R to R. In my case, I got lucky because it was 16. 16 times 0 0.04 is 0 0.64. Obviously, the square root of 64 is 8. So that made it easy. If you need a calculator or you need a computer to do it, then take your number and take the square root of it. Now I'm going to take 0 0.32 divided by 0 0.8, and I got 0 0.4 seconds.
from. So that's where we will put your corrected QT interval. We take QT divided by the square root of RR. Hopefully it gets somewhere around 0.4. Less is obviously okay. What you're worried about is too long of a QT. Again, the reason you're worried about too long of a QT is too long of a QT can lead to one cell backwards activating its neighbor after its neighboring cell has come out of refraction. The last thing we're going to do is ST segment. We're going to combine these together. We're going to look at ST segment and normal T wave together. Do you have a normal ST? What we're looking at here is the shape out here. To be honest with repolarization, we're looking at repolarization essentially. And that's difficult to predict how repolarization is going to be affected. So you're really just looking for a change in repolarization. If you put somebody under stress, there's less blood flow to the heart and repolarization is altered, that indicates there's not enough blood flow to the heart. So in a normal heart, again we're looking at out here, but what we're really looking at is cardiac muscle action features. And again, whether you're talking about a heart, or you're talking about an individual cell, what you need is blood flow. And the reason you need blood flow is when this cell, or collectively this part, goes through an action potential, it needs potassium to leave. So potassium needs to leave at this point of the action potential at repolarization. Now you got all this potassium hanging around, and of course some of it's going to get pumped back into the cell by the sodium potassium ATPase, but you need some help bringing in fresh blood, turning up this fluid, so to speak, so you don't get potassium, potassium imbalances. So you need blood flowing through here to make sure that this potassium doesn't get out of balance. How it could get out of, out of balance is unpredictable, to be honest. It could be elevated. It could be depressed. or the T wave could be inverted. What's generally happening here is there's something wrong with repolarization. And the something wrong, again, whether we're talking about the heart as, as a whole, or we're talking about an individual cell, I need blood flow through here so that when this potassium comes out, I can get everything straightened away again. Why do I need to get everything straightened away again? Because if there's a lot of potassium out here, when it comes time to repolarize the cell, this potassium doesn't want to leave. And if it doesn't want to leave, then repolarization will not happen correctly. And usually by happen correctly, it means all the cells will not repolarize in unison. They'll repolarize in their own individual way. Which means you'll see something change in the ST. So what's happening here is if there's a lack of blood flow, the sequence that I'm trying to work through, is if there's an occlusion of the blood vessel, I can't get this potassium out of here anymore. So when it comes time to repolarize this cell, this potassium doesn't want to leave. If this potassium doesn't want to leave, it alters repolarization of cardiac muscle. And there's no predicting how it's going to alter it, 
but somehow you're going to see a change in the ST. If you need to be elevated, depressed, or inverted. The bottom line is, is these changes upon stress indicate that you don't have enough blood flow to wash out this potassium and get it back in balance. So the problem is, is you need bypass surgery, you need a stent, or you need something to get blood flowing through these vessels better. While you're normally just sitting or sitting in a recliner, you have enough blood flow. Put this person on a treadmill, start working that muscle, the muscle starts contracting and kicking out more potassium, now all of a sudden you see that there's a problem with blood flow. So it happens, happened to my dad, happens plenty of times. Dad went in to get a stress test and he got admitted that day and bypass was scheduled the next day. So my dad went in, got a stress test, had an inverted T, the inverted T tells him that he is not getting enough blood flow to wash out potassium so repolarization is effective. The big change is, it has to happen from on the treadmill, from not on the treadmill to on the treadmill if the T wave changes. So if your T wave changes with stress, that indicates you don't have enough blood flow to your heart.